I just want to thank you for that. So uh, God is doing things all, all, all around the place. You know, we begin every staff meeting, we call it fruit. What fruitfulness has been? What testimonies are around? And, you know, sometimes you may just come on a Sunday, but I want to say this, God moving all the times in all different areas, at all different ages, and with all different stages. And uh, we thank God that we don't serve a God that is kind of just on the surface, but that wants to connect with us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray, oh Lord, that you would just help me as I speak your word. Father, that you would use what I'm about to say, oh God, and draw people to yourself, oh God. Father, don't draw them to a man, don't draw them to a church. Draw them to you, oh Lord, as I speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So our theme this year, if you haven't been before, is follow me and I will make you. And I started thinking about the posture of following. What, what does it actually mean? And the word following brings the real the thought really of connection. Because following is not isolationist. It takes at least two people, two groups for there to be following. There has to be some connection. One person is leading or group's leading, going somewhere, bringing about and setting direction. And they're connected to another person who gives weight to what that person is doing through regarding what they're saying and being obedient to the one that's actually doing the leading. See, there's nothing individualistic about following. If there is no, there is no following if there's no partnership, if you're the only one in a, in a partnership, that's not following, you're just out walking. So as I said, there's nothing individualistic about this. There's, there's only connection if true fellowship has actually happening. It's also not following if you're only the one that's giving the direction or giving the instruction. You are the leader, you're not the follower. God doesn't want us telling him what to do, instructing him, being the one to give, to, to give direction to God. No, we take direction and instruction from God. So by its very definition, there has to be two parties involved if following is gonna be part of the equation. So if you think about it, Jesus asking us to follow him is a masterstroke. Because what he's saying, I'm going to build in this process of discipleship. I'm going to build in in this process of faith. I'm going to build in in this process of being a Christian, a way in which you can stay connected to me. I'm going to build in a way that, that we don't have to become disconnected, that you're not just all by yourself. I'm going to build in a way by asking you to follow me. Because the moment you lose sight of the one that you're following, you actually become disconnected. So it's a masterstroke of heaven that Jesus would say, come follow me and I'm going to make you. See, I'm not on my own walk. I walk with Jesus. He's the one leading me. He's the one directing my step and I'm the one following me. Another important aspect or observation regarding following is that there is a direction set. The leader sets a direction. He says, follow me. She says, follow me. There's a, a leading. There's a, there's a direction that's set. It's saying, I want you to focus on something. I don't want you to be all like this. There needs to be a certainty to the path that you're walking because you're following someone. You know, we've all followed someone in a car and then for some reason, they decided to go through an orange light I want to say, if you're leading someone and saying, follow me to somewhere, don't go through an orange light, all right? The person behind you can't, all right? So they're going to go through red. So who's ever, and then you just lost them. Where do they go? Yeah, I just hope, please let them kind of pull to the side and hopefully they wait over. See, and then if you go in the wrong direction, I think they went that way, but did they turn left here? You're going to end up lost. You're going to end up disconnected. All of a sudden, you're, you're disconnected from the person that you're following. So this morning, I want to talk to those of you that right now 
are feeling disconnected from God. You love God. You know you need to follow God. But right now, you feel disconnected. And you can sit there and say, well, I'm in church. And let me tell you, that's a good start. But you can be in church and you can be disconnected from God. And there are reasons we get disconnected. And I want to say, God himself hasn't moved. God's actually pulled over on the side of the road and he's waiting for you to come his way. So don't beat yourself up today about getting disconnected. Just decide, I'm going to reconnect. So we're going to have a look at some reasons we get disconnected. Number one is we look back. See, looking back disconnects you. The moment I go like this, all of a sudden, I'm disconnected from you all, right? Now, I'm not gonna preach like this this morning. Oh, church, you're doing so great. In five minutes, right, you just get disconnected. I remember once doing a video preach. And uh, when sometimes when I'm away, you watch myself on video, and I do the preach, and I was doing it, and Pastor Neil was here, and uh, he was the only one in the room. So there was a, a connection there, and I'm preaching away, and, and it was fine. But someone rang him up, and he didn't want to, like, take the call in the middle of me doing the preach. So he left the room. And all of a sudden, I am preaching to a completely empty room. I had my notes. I, know, I just lost it. I just go, no, that's it. We have to do that all again. Right now, it's not Neil's fault. He was actually trying to do the right thing. He didn't want to, yeah, Julie, all right, I will bring home the milk. Right, no, so, uh, no, <laughs> sorry. Like, he was actually trying to do the right thing so he wouldn't disturb me, but I lost connection. You, un you understand there needs to be connection. Looking back always breaks connection. Yet looking back is always gonna be a temptation in following Jesus because he inevitably calls you to leave something behind. When he talked to his disciples, he says, leave your nets, leave your fishing, leave what you know, leave all of those things and come follow me. Yeah. Right, that's what he's saying, leave something. We also have to leave something behind. Taking the next step in Jesus means you're gonna leave something behind. You know, when I got married, and this is for you, Jason, right? I had to leave something behind. Right? When you're single, you can do what you want, when you want, how you want, no matter as many times as you want, because you're just you. You can just do it. But every time when you get married, all of a sudden, no. All right? All of a sudden, there's someone else that you have to take into consideration all the time. I had an extremely messy bedroom. Right? I, I would just literally just wash once a month. Right? I get all the clothes, I had enough clothes to last a month. Then I get all the clothes, and then I go down the laundry mat, take all four washing machines, right? And, uh, and, and just do it. It was awesome. Right? And I just threw it in my room, on my bed, didn't care. No one could say so. I probably didn't even open the curtains for six months. Right? I, I could tell you something else, but you'd just all leave in disgust. Right? <laughs> Just there wasn't a lot of washing going on, right? And uh, it was just, I didn't care. It's fine. But when I got married, it's no longer just my bedroom anymore. Oh. All, of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, I just can't leave things and just do things. It's funny, when Nina goes away to Adelaide, ha, I can just go back, right? <laughs> you know, honey, when you go to Adelaide, I don't even wipe... I don't even use that thing on the shower screen. I don't even do it. I just let the water stay there. All right? See? Sorry, excuse us. All right. So you've got to leave something behind if you want to go on. So let me tell you, it was much better being married to Nina than it was being single. Right? There's some things I had to leave behind, but what God promises is always better than what He asks us to leave behind. Every time you take a step on your walk with God in following Jesus, you leave something behind so that you can go to where Jesus is leading, where God is leading. Maybe you need to leave an attitude behind. Maybe there's an attitude that you have and, and God's just saying, you are not better than anyone else. And you need to park your arrogance. You need to park your confidence that, that belittles other people. Maybe there's a behavior 
that you have, that, that God says, no, in, in my work with you, that, that's not going to ride, that's not going to fly anymore. You can't lie to get out of trouble. Maybe that's been something that you've done over the years and you get in trouble, something's going to happen, the boss is there Monday, all this is, and so you tell like a little bit of a lie to, to stay out of trouble and God's saying, no, where I'm going to take you, I need honesty. Where I'm going to take you, what I have for you, I need you to change things. Maybe there's a right that you have. Right? Maybe you have a right to, to have this unforgiveness because what they did to you was wrong. Anyone would agree that it was wrong. They should have known better. They shouldn't have done it. It was terrible what they did. And you have a right, but maybe God's saying, you need to leave that right and take on forgiveness and take on the ability to say, I'm sorry, or to go and forgive someone who has hurt you. Maybe there's a relationship that you know they're having more effect on you than you are on them and God's saying, you need to leave that behind. You see, following Jesus is an action. It's not just an intention. Wanting to follow Jesus is actually different to actually following Jesus. You have to move. And without some form of action, you will get disconnected because God's on the move. God is always doing something. With God, nothing is impossible. Let me say where you put the apostrophe there. With God, nothing is impossible. It's impossible for God to be involved in something and nothing happens. So without, with God, nothing is impossible. So there you stay doing nothing eventually you're going to become disconnected from God because He is moving. And the second most quoted verse in the Bible is is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Many of you have that written somewhere. Many of you would be holding on to that as a promise from God. We all can say it with us. Many of us would have memorized it. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. When God thinks about you, when He speaks about you, when He speaks about you, He speaks about the future you. He doesn't speak about the past you. He doesn't even speak about the now you. His prophetic word over you is always His desire for you about who you are becoming, not you you are right now. Every prophetic word that you've ever received has been about your future, usually telling you that your past has been overcome by that future. God has always done it. God called Abraham the father of many nations when he hasn't even got one child and he's 100 years old and it's too late for all of that. He calls Moses a deliverer of the people when he's living in exile in the desert because he's made some mistakes. David's anointed king over Israel when his own father thinks he's a nothing at all and he ends up just being in the back blocks like kind of looking after sheep. Gideon is called the mighty man of valor when he's the least of his family who are the least of their tribes who are the least of the tribes of Israel. Right? God speaks, you are mighty man of valor. Paul is chosen, is called, Paul is called a chosen instrument to carry God's name to the Gentiles when he's on the way to actually kill Christians. He has an encounter with God and his first thing is, Paul, you are going to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. That's amazing. He's on his way to kill Christians and now he's the one to go and make Christians. These people and many others in the Bible were described as God saw them to be, not as they had been and not even as they were. Now I want to say learn from the past. Certainly learn from your mistakes. But learning from the past should all be about moving forward instead of just keeping you stuck. It's taking you, it's removing obstacles from your Future, so you can be where God wants to take you. Don't repeat the same mistakes. That's just smart. Because your future 
is made up of you overcoming some of those things. So in your past, yes, you failed. Yes, you sinned. Yes, you gave up. Yes, people did use you. Yes, people did terrible things to you. Yes, you didn't have it as easy as other people did. But stop looking back with those things becoming an anchor that stop you from going forward in your walk in following God. Remove some of those obstacles so you can walk easier in following God, but don't look back saying, I can never go forward. I can't follow God because these things are in my life. Looking back with an attitude to grow into your future is wise. Looking back with an attitude of longing or regret only gets you into trouble. Many people have problems today because they can't let go of what happened yesterday. See, proper looking back is designed to propel you into your future, not to keep you rooted to a spot. See, even the rear vision mirror in your car is positioned in a place where you've actually got to look forward. It's purposely designed small because I'm not supposed to look behind to see what might potentially happen. So, so I, I, I look and I glance, oh, there's an ambulance coming. I need to pull over. It, it helps me, but it's a glance. It's to get me to my future. It's something I glance at. It's not something that I focus on. Yeah, the past, every now and again, I said, did you do a real check? You know, like, it's a good thing to have a check, but it's there to help you with your future, not to keep you stuck in a particular place. When God rescued Lot and his family from Sodom, before he, 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 he uh, kind of like judged the land, he said to him, I'm going to do these things. And when they happen, he goes, don't look back. And Lot's wife does look back and she becomes a pillar of salt. She got disconnected. She, she got stuck. She looked at where she came from and because of that, she couldn't go forward. And that's what happens when you live just looking back, you get stuck. See, I believe that she looked with a longing, with a lack of trust that God was able to do what he said he was going to do, that God was able to take her to something better. The Israelites looked back to Egypt. They didn't like the realities of pushing through to get what God had for them. Oh, that we could have the leeks and garlics of Egypt. Now, I do like leeks and garlic. I think they're pretty good. But they actually made up a fantasy about their past, of how good their lives were in Egypt. They complained, saying that the leeks and garlics of Egypt were better than dying in the wilderness. But that was a fantasy. The reality is that they'd been saved and delivered from an evil pharaoh who beat them regularly and made them make bricks without straw. It was only in their minds how good the past was. It wasn't reality. And many times you're looking back is actually fantasy and not reality. When the Israelites were complaining about God and looking back, it only demonstrated their lack of trust in God. God wants to kill us in the wilderness. But they didn't look forward to the promise they looked back. They didn't wait. They didn't do a faith walk. They didn't want a faith walk. They wanted to walk by sight. But our faith is not a sight walk. And this is crucial to following God. It's by faith. It's not by sight. I have to trust that what God is leading me into is the promised land. And it's going to be a land of pomegranates and all the other things that they had there. See, we want everything mapped out. I want to guarantee you success. I don't want any trouble. But I want to tell you there's no actual faith in that. So when you look back at without the future in mind, you actually glorify the past and you get tempted to just settle and not to look at what God is doing in your life and where he's taking you. And that disconnects you. See, Jesus called, the, the, called us to look forward. He told us, us leave your nets Come follow me. You used to fish for fish. I'm now going to make you fishers of men. And because 
They did such a good job of that. There's churches and Christianity has taken on and moved throughout the whole world. Paul said, forgetting what is behind, I press on. I press on in my calling to serve Christ. It isn't always easy. I press on. I I break through those things, those paths. I break through. I, I press on. My question this morning, are you pressing on in your calling to serve and follow Jesus? Reason number two is disappointment. Disappointment, discouragement, setbacks. We have all felt like this every now and again. And if you haven't, you're a liar or just wait. (laughs) And you get to this place where you just really can't be bothered. You've tried it. It didn't work. You prayed and your prayer wasn't answered. You served and no one even appreciated you. So you stop and you sit down and you take a breather. Just take it easy. And, you know, to be honest, that that would be okay. I definitely believe there's some rest stops in our journey in following Jesus, not just this action, 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 action. I do believe that there's rest stops. I do believe. But you can't stay there. It's always for a time. You've got to get up and go again. If you were going to drive to Adelaide, there'd be a number of times you would stop. Take it easy, have a sleep, do something along those, just take some rest, take your time in doing that trip. But you're never going to get to LA if you just stay there in Coffs Harbour. It's not going to happen. So I want to say this morning, for some people, it's time to get up again, to get going again. Rest time is over. Hebrews 6.9 says this, We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. I think I'm going to do a sermon on the better things that come with salvation. There's a whole lot more than just getting saved. There's a whole lot more in following Jesus and just getting a spot in heaven. Right? For God is not unfair. He will not forget how hard you have worked for Him and how you have sown your love to Him by caring for other Christians as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep right on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. And so in brackets there, I've just put disconnected. See, that's what happened. At some stage, you get so busy serving and doing and, and following and, and all these different things that, that, that you just kind of stop. But you've got to keep on going, keep on doing it. Keep right on loving so that you don't become spiritually dull. That's what happens in a rest place. You need to actually get those spiritual muscles working and and doing those things. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and patience. See, God's promises are designed to keep me looking forward. There's a design in them. As I go after the promise that that only heaven can bring about, I'm forced to exercise my faith. I'm forced to believe. I'm forced to pray. I'm forced to seek to see those things happen. And so instead of becoming dull and indifferent, there's a stirring. There's something I want to do. There's an energy that actually comes. And God, once again, designs promises because He's a master designer. So that's how I access heaven. If I want to see heaven at work, go after the promise because that promise can only happen if God has helping you. What a great verse. God's promises are one of the better things that come with salvation. But a promise of God will be contended for. A promise from God will come with his troubles, but through faith and patience. Faith and patience. A promise keeps you connected. And that's why I go on all the time. Have you got a life word from God? Have you got a scripture or a number of scriptures that whether you're 8 or 88, that God has still got something in speaking and able to bring an encouragement into your life? Reason number three, you get disconnected, you just lose the care factor. Uh, This is very interesting as I was preparing this message because I'd never really thought of things in terms like this. 
But I think right now, in the year 2024, more than any other time in the history of the world. So that's a big statement. I think it's easier to lose sight of why faith matters, of why following Jesus is even more important than ever. Because there are more distractions right now than there's ever been. Up till 70 years ago, throughout of history, and if you wanted to go like just 150 years ago, now think of all of history, right? Life was pretty simple. Generally, the majority of people stayed pretty much where they lived, right? You didn't go, you know, like this week I'm going to Indonesia. That would have been a massive thing even 70 years ago, 150 years ago, my goodness, right? They, they worked when it was light. Just think of the difference. Electricity is made. All of a sudden, there's no electricity for the next six months. Our lives change everything. I'd be the only one who'd live because Nina's got such a stack of different things that she's <laughs> saying. I reckon I've got about two years' worth of stuff, right? Even though the freezer would die. There's no electricity. I'd have to eat a lot of meat that week, right? But it's just, it's just changed. Travel wasn't a thing. They'd work when it was light, stay home when it was dark. Seventy years ago, their entertainment consisted of listening to the radio, going to a dance hall or a pub or football or cricket on the weekends. Even when TV did come probably 50 years ago, there were just four channels. Women stayed at home and mainly looked after the family. Fathers went to work and came home. The week was Monday to Friday. Saturday was to do jobs and sport, and Sunday was church and family. So in many ways, it was much simpler to be a Christian. And I only want to say, it was obviously for pastors, I reckon, a lot easier. 2024 is different. 25% of all dwellings are just one-person dwellings. So on the way home, a quarter, one in four of all the houses that you're going past has only one person in that house. 30% of all families are blended families. There's only 33% of families now that are mum, dad, and kids. Wow. That's staggering, isn't it? Yeah. Right? It's a staggering thing. We're living in a different world. Work is every day now. I'm guessing it would be pretty much 50% of people now, or maybe even under, that work a Monday to Friday, 37, 40 hour week sort of thing. Choice and options are king. There's every type of restaurant you could ever think of. There's every type of spore. There used to be four TV channels. I counted that on my phone alone, I have eight streaming services. KO is the one I'd look at the most. <laughs> Life, though, we have everything. And we've done it to make it easier. And I haven't even talked about social media and the power of just suggestion and comparison and all of those different things. What happens is that there are all these distractions and calls on our lives and resources. So it's now harder than any other time to follow Jesus than it has been in history. Mark 4, 18, I want the band to come. Jesus in the parable of the sower explaining it. Says, and others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. You know, I... I've read this scripture many times. I've spoken on this scripture many times. But just recently, just a week or so ago, I saw that last line. And it says, and it proves unfruitful. Maybe I hadn't read it in this particular version before, even though I think I would have. It proves unfruitful. We are living in the thorniest times ever where the things of this world are, are just thrown into our face where it's very difficult, you know, and, and sacrifices and decisions need to be made for, you know, someone to stay at home. But generally, most people need to work just to pay the bills and put a roof over their heads. 
You know, like, I think the average house price in Brisbane right now is in the 800,000s. How does a young couple start with that? 800,000, right? It's, it's, it's crazy. How do they do that? It's hard. There's, there's distractions. The, 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 I, I, but what about this? And then I see on Instagram, well, they've got that. And oh my goodness, they're doing this. And how can I, my gosh, I can't even go to Everton Park and these guys are going to London, right? Like what's going on? There's all these things, this desire comes in. The cares of this world. You know, I decided that I'm just going to really limit how much I just read the news, not because I want to be ignorant, because it's always directing me to the negative. It's always directing me to something that, that cannot be overcome, that is terrible, that is bad, that is like, oh, it's, it's, and I just don't, I want to be taken away. I don't want the cares of this world. Because the Bible says in this world you are going to have troubles. But Jesus said, I have overcome the world. That's why it's so important to follow Jesus. He's the one who's overcome the world. And what happens, it says that if you let those desires start to overtake, you, you let those other things enter into your heart, it proves unfruitful. Your Christianity, your faith doesn't work. So you come to church, you read your word, you do these things, but it doesn't work because it's not what I'm really about. I do it because I'm kind of supposed to. I find it, fit it in. And if you don't actually live it, it proves unfruitful, can't work. And so even in your chasing and even in your going and doing, you don't actually receive because you're not actually following. You become disconnected, the cares of this world, the desire for riches comes in. God understands. God understands. God's not, come on, you don't care about me. God understands. It's difficult. It's difficult with all the different distractions This in this 2024. But we still need to stay connected. It's us to us to stay connected. And so today I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to ask them, but I am going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. And we're just going to spend five or so minutes actually just in worship. Worship is designed to connect you to God. I want to show you something. There's praise and worship. When you walked into church today, you probably cared less about all the different things. You know, I hope I see this person. I like that. You know, different things. But you're not really that connected to God. Some of you may have prayed. Some of you may have listened to worship in the car. But generally, you kind of come a little bit disconnected. So what happens is that we sing a bit of a praise song. We get you to stand, clap your hands. Do, you know, every now and again, get, do a bit of a jig, do a bit of a dance, do something along those lines. Right, but we get your, your body involved. Here we're in church. Oh, that's right. We just kind of get you, oh, start to think about God. Then you move into kind of like worship. Because what we do is we want you to go, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not just thinking about God now. I, I'm connecting to God. Which is why one person can be fully in the presence of God, just like shaking, doing things. And the next person, next to him is like this. Right? Because one has welcomed the presence, one has resisted the presence. But the Bible says that when our praise comes up, our God's presence comes down. So you have a choice. I can connect or I can resist. I can raise my hands and my heart and, and, and I can connect to God or I can just observe and show me why you're worth it. And today I want to ask you to engage. I'm going to ask you to engage. I'm going to ask that maybe Chris, just, just place. I want everyone to close their eyes. Ooh. He's here. Jesus. 
engage with your heavenly Father. Holy Spirit is here. Put aside the urgent. Seek after the important. Seek after Jesus, for He has overcome the world. Put aside your looking back. Put aside your setbacks, disappointments. Put aside the cares of this world, those desires that are taking you away from God. Old Testament, incense was very important. Is because in the Old Testament, what would happen? There'd be sacrifices every day. There'd be burnt offerings every day. So the smell of burnt flesh, the smell of sacrifice was all over that place. But then they would burn the incense and that burn of the incense would, with the smell and the scent of that incense would cover the smell of the sacrifice, would, would cover the smell of the, of the burnt offering. And today as you worship, the presence of God the, is going to come and it's going to cover the, the, the sacrifice, the disappointment, the, the looking back, the mistakes and the failures. Today, in this morning, engage and allow the incense of your worship to overwhelm and overtake and let it be a sweet-smelling smell that you smell as we worship. <laughs> 